think anybody who comes and actually sees this uh, professional services symposium, sees the types of interactions that our vice presidents are having with, with these firms, if anybody actually sees that, they would be very excited to do it themselves. My recollection is that we started talking about this when we were uh, at lunch and you were concerned about uh, how do we get more wealth into our community, which would mean you'd have more successful minority entrepreneurs, more successful minority leaders in business, and then ultimately some of those success stories would ultimately end up uh, qualifying to be on the board of the University of Chicago. Uh, the insight of saying that we needed to think about this in terms of a different way of approaching uh, minority and women-owned businesses uh, was very important because as you well know and as you pointed out there are so many institutions that think about uh, minority-owned businesses particularly in terms of very limited set of opportunities in terms of uh, facilities, janitorial services, um, and that's uh, a very limited set of opportunities for people and for the institution it's not taking advantage of all the talent that there is out there. Well, one of the things you understood right away was that the economy has also evolved over the last generation. It used to be that our economy was much more of a manufacturing based economy and now it's moved into more of a professional services technology based economy and if you were going to be working with minority owned businesses you wanted to have minority businesses participating in the parts of the economy that were growing and where wealth is being created today. Well, you know, part of my job is to make sure and give people um, sort of a framework for actually helping them do their job better. And I believe that this program was actually going to help every vice president do their job better because they would have access uh, to talent. And uh, I think that's exactly what's happened. Well, the University of Chicago really is a role model for other universities throughout the United States. I think we're still the only university that's committed to working with minority businesses outside of the traditional construction and catering commodity-based part of the economy. And the professional team here has worked so hard to execute it. Not just talk a good game and make promises and empty promises. People have actually fulfilled uh, the commitment to really work with a wide range of businesses. Not only is Hyde Park a community that uh, embraces diversity and inclusion and, and, and believes in different, having bring different ideas and different perspectives, the university also uh, brings that special perspective of really respecting different points of view and realizing when you bring people together who are going to have rigorous inquiry and, and bring different ideas to the table. This whole sense of not just being an open place, but that you need that openness to actually be um, great along the lines that we aspire, uh, aspire to. So uh, just as the issue about bringing uh, talent uh, is important, this issue about being uh, open and uh, welcoming to diverse points of view, diverse backgrounds, diverse experiences, all of that makes us better and fits with what it is we're trying to be. Melody, 10 years ago when I first decided that I was going to bring minority professional service firms to the university to meet with our um, senior decision makers, Money management was not an area that I was even thinking about. And when I met you, one of the first things you said to me was, endowments are not hiring minority money management firms. And I don't know if you recall me saying to you that in order for me to make an impact in that area, that I was certainly willing to try, but in order for me to make an impact in that area, I needed you to teach me the industry because I at that time had no knowledge of investment industry at all. I totally remember that. First of all, I remember that we met at a speech that I was giving in the suburbs of Chicago and I remember you came up and you spoke to me and I started to talk to you immediately about the areas that I thought needed to be addressed when it came to 
minority firms specifically as it related to investment management. And that wasn't necessarily about Ariel at all. It was just in general that this was a problem that I thought no one was talking about. And what I loved about that encounter is that your eyes perked up and you immediately said, I need to learn about this and what should I do? And you subsequently followed up with me and you came to my office and I sat down with you and explained to you how everything worked. And you had follow-up meetings after that where you would go deeper and deeper to try to understand. So you said, I want to be informed when I bring this up and when I advocate for minority firms. And an informed person advocating is the very best thing. And uh, I think that's why you've had such great results. My conversations, those early conversations with you were really what enabled me to ultimately sit down and have you know, detailed discussions with our endowment team. At the end of the day, me bringing in initially about 15 firms and the university, two years after that, hired we hired our first two African-American um, money management firms and now we have uh, about 12 minority and women-owned um, investment firms. Here's what I think is great. One, you wanted knowledge and you realized that knowledge would be power and that gave you I think a great deal of confidence when you went in to have the conversation with the endowment team. Two, because you had done your homework, I'm sure they were much more open to the conversation. Right. You hadn't done a light rinse, you'd gone deep on the subject matter, and I'm sure that made for a very, very fulfilling discussion back and forth, and perhaps some aha moments on their side as well. And I think you have to give them a lot of credit for being open to the discussion, and ultimately moving on the issue in terms of um, firms actually being hired over the course of the last few years, which I think is not only noteworthy, it's something to be applauded. I am sure those firms were hired on their merits. Yes. And the great thing about the investment business is the results are the results. So, as I like to say, math has no opinion. So why do you think minority firms have such a challenge with um, getting opportunities with endowments and, and foundations as well? I think there are a number of reasons that we have a hard time with endowments and foundations around the country and in various you know, parts of the nonprofit world. I think some of it is just people are used to working with the people that they've known for a very long time and it's very hard to break in. I, I think that's true in life. Um, but I think this area is particularly hardwired around some long-term relationships. I think the other thing is that unfortunately we don't uh, necessarily get the opportunity to get in front of everyone in the way that we would hope to so that we could make our case face to face and eyeball to eyeball and hopefully be conv convincing and compelling. And I think the other thing is there's, there's clearly institutional bias that is in certain organizations. I'm not calling people racist. I'm not trying to um, create any form of defensiveness. I'm just saying that when you look at the history of something over very long periods of time and you see that no one has ever broken through, you just have to ask yourself some questions about the process and what bias is creeping in that's keeping people out. So I think those there are a host of reasons why that has happened. I'm hopeful also that University of Chicago's leadership in this regard will break down some barriers for firms like Ariel and other firms all over the country. I mean, this is super important, what has happened at University of Chicago. We want to keep this movement going. It's so important uh, for the university and for our state, but it also serves as a model for other major institutions in our state of Illinois. I'm marveled actually by uh, the system that we have in, in the U.S. Uh, that uh, it gave me the opportunity to come here from India 16 years ago and uh, gave me an education and uh, an opportunity to have a better life. And I think that's the uh, uh, sort of similar framework you, you could say we have in this diversity symposium to uh, in, include people from all backgrounds, all ethnicities. I was really excited when we decided to partner with you because Johnson Publishing and your father um, were such an icon um, here in Chicago but around the world as well and it just seemed right that the university would partner with you. Yeah, actually it was, um, it turned out to be a, a great partnership mm -hmm. and um, I thank you for leading that charge and for the University of Chicago for being so 
um, I think, forthright and forthcoming and, and innovative and almost really cutting edge and coming to us, yeah. coming to Ebony, um, to really have a partnership to really talk about diversity and the platforms that um, the University of Chicago can could offer as far as diversity is concerned and then to come to Ebony, which is I think a great platform. It turned out to be I think a really great um, partnership for, for both. But it really was the first time that the University of Chicago had ever ran you know, an ad campaign in uh, a, a national magazine and also a magazine that really um, was geared towards the African American community. Right. And so it was huge for the university to take that step and say, you know, we want to start targeting um, the African American community on a national scale and, and looking at how we can utilize this platform to diversify our uh, student body at the university. To be able to partner with Ebony just gave, I think, for the university, it was a smart move for them to directly target the African American community mm -hmm. in a space with a vehicle like Ebony that is very well respected, very authentic, very well regarded, and so therefore it gave credibility for the University of Chicago and um, it showed their real sincerity mm -hmm. towards wanting to reach this community. Mm -hmm. And then we went and we took the magazine live essentially yeah. and this is really where I would say the second part of the innovation of this relationship took place and we did a round table, education round table. Yeah. Just for me sitting back and watching how the two groups, the university's creative team worked with your creative team to pull off this event and I think we did that in probably a month. Yeah, it was very, I know that was a very short time frame um, and we had, uh, I, know, I remember Tamron Hall was the, mm -hmm. was the host and mm -hmm. um, as you said from MSNBC and, um, and MSNBC did um, carry the live feed of it, I believe. Yes. So mm -hmm. that was that was wonderful. But mm -hmm. yeah, you know, we came together as partners. Yeah. We came together mm -hmm. in building a relationship and building a relationship that was going to lead to a purposeful outcome for both. Yes. For both entities. What's most helpful to us is when somebody talks about their individual expertise and how they approach their work because the most important part about this symposium is the opportunity to get a feel and a comfort level for the people that you may be calling to hire. The opportunity for me and for the women and minority partners working with me for this university to represent it has been significant and one that we are really unlikely to have gotten but for the exposure brought by this program. And that is because even in large, successful, diversity-aware law firms, women and lawyers of color, including partners, are all too often invisible, invisible to firm clients and potential clients, and to our white male colleagues who are the most frequent referral sources of business. Starting with the symposium, as I mentioned, we had the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one session with actual constituents who might actually need our services in finance, accounting, HR, and, and IT. And with that, they helped open all the doors from there. They made it easy for us. They made the introductions. They were there to encourage us, to coach us, make us laugh. Then it moved into a true collaboration, not just as another vendor, but as a partner. And, and, I, and I don't use that lightly, it was a true uh, game changer for us. We, at one time, didn't have any diverse law firms working with our legal team, now we have two. Um, we have been brought on two um, information technology firms, one that has helped us to um, redesign our intranet, uh, another firm that has done leadership development with our senior leadership, another firm is right now working with our entire um, senior leadership in our diversity and inclusion um, uh, initiative throughout the organization so these started as small um, uh, relationships where people just met to full-blown presentations to full-blown contracts now that are actually working uh, with us over a long period of time. What this university is doing is unprecedented and this idea of an elite institution an amazing research and academic institution bringing in fantastic professionals <laughs> to help them grow and to help them prosper um, unfortunately, you can probably count on one hand, if that, uh, the number of universities around the nation who have this kind of long-term commitment 
and not just talk, but action. Working with the University of Chicago, the Medical Center, and Argonne Lab has been great for us, and this relationship suggests a wonderful intellectual environment. We are privileged to be partners with the university, and it is inspiring to work with the brilliant people at every level of this organization. The Professional Service Symposium is designed to inspire and help minority professional firms pursue their destiny. The University of Chicago is unique because, as you can see in today's symposium, there is such a wealth of, of companies that are bringing forth their best products, their best thinking, um, they're bringing efficiencies, they're bringing innovation. So from that perspective, the University of Chicago is ahead of its time because it's really making sure that minority-owned firms are truly integral to the fabric of the university. And I think, again, as I said before, this is a testament of its success. The fact that the University of Chicago provides a forum where firms can come in, present their skills, and hear what the needs are of the university. That's very helpful to us in terms of growing our business. So it does make a difference when you invest in your people, right? There's three pillars of investment. There's financial capital, physical capital, and human capital. I constantly say that human capital continues to be the best investment that we can make. So the symposium, I think, has really been successful because of the commitment of the vice presidents, um, but also taking the time to really get that buy-in early on. One of the powerful things about the symposium over the nine years has been to see the way that the vice presidents who lead the areas that do the, the procurement have embraced it. Mm -hmm. And not only embraced it, but kind of looked forward to it. Yeah. every year and both connecting with the businesses and the companies and meeting new ones but also kind of connecting with each other and pushing each other mm -hmm. to see how they can do more and one of the things I'm excited about for the future is thinking about how we can move the envelope even further mm -hmm. in setting ambitious goals perhaps even by department yeah. um, which I think will will help with the ambition of the vice presidents and their teams to really think about how can we strive for more opportunity, more um, firms that they work with. I think will also help with accountability because when you have goals and you're looking and measuring yourself each and every year to see how you're performing against the goals, it gives you a measure of, am I living up to that? Am I hitting it or not? Right. We clearly have the commitment there, yeah. um, but now, the next step is to have that commitment and that accountability, which will really increase um, the level of business that we're doing with the minority and women-owned businesses. So I think it's really important that we also look to engage these businesses for a long-term basis and not just having you know these one-off opportunities. So I think the accountability piece and, and, and setting the goals will really help us so that we can also see, you know, how many years have we actually done business with some of these firms and, and what the true economic impact is, you know, for those firms and as well as, you know, locally here in Chicago and, and nationally as well. One of the things that, I, that I'm proudest of, and I know you are too, has been how um, this program has become a model and people are looking to it. and. I sometimes get asked, what are the key ingredients mm -hmm. to make this successful? Um, you know, everyone, a lot of places have business diversity programs, but they're not getting the results that we're getting. Mm -hmm. And I often, I always start with, you have to have the, the leadership at the top. Mm -hmm. And this initiative wouldn't be what it is without John Rogers on our board, mm -hmm. Bob Zimmer, our president, really setting the tone in terms of the importance to the university, the value, putting their own time and energy into it, being ambassadors for it. Every time John speaks, he talks <laughs> about it. And I think that leadership is key, but you also need the people to execute, someone like yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's important that your role is a senior role within the university. You're not in the bowels of the institution, you're at a senior level, which enables you to have direct access and engage with the vice president and the decision makers who are having these contracts 
um, opportunities. And I think that I tell people that if you really want to be successful, you have to have the person driving the day to day that can be in the room. It's in the room with the people making mm -hmm. the decisions because that it's relationship based mm -hmm. and it's influence based. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a critical mm -hmm. part of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are kudos to you as well. I mean, you Thank built you. this over 10 years, but I think some of those key elements are what makes it, what contributed to making it so successful. Yeah, and I think that's really important in professional services because these opportunities, they don't go through procurement, right? So That's when, right. you That's know, right. when a vice president is looking to hire, exactly right. um, you know, a financial firm, they're picking up the phone and they're calling someone they know, um, someone that they've had long-term relationships with. One of the things I'm really excited about on the 10-year anniversary <laughs> is your decision to create an award mm -hmm. to give to the vice president or the department that in your estimation for that year has really performed at an extremely high level in creating opportunities and cultivating opportunities um, for minority firms in their space. Yeah, it would be nice to have a legacy yeah. of an award named after him because he's done so much um, work in this area.